Welcome again to uh, week three of this course, uh, Intro to Visual Communication. Today we'll talk about icons, images, and symbols. A very, very interesting topic, a very complex one, and I'll do my best to be uh, as clear as possible given that there is really a lot to discuss this week. And I will also encourage students to review the attached slideshow uh, to better familiarize with the concept presented in this lecture. So let's start. Um, the subtitle here is how to understand the underlying structure of art through the linguistic and semiotic analysis of human visual representation. So um, in this class I would like to talk about language and art. Okay? So the communication piece of uh, this class. So within visual communication, as I mentioned many times, there is definitely art and art history, but there is also a lot of philosophy, psychology, and literature, because those are multiple words combined in one. So symbolism and communication is the first part of this lecture, and I would like to answer, as usual, very uh, concrete uh, questions. Uh, what is a symbol, first of all? Uh, where do we get them? Uh, where do we find them in art, in literature? Uh, are symbols and signs the same thing? Are metaphors and allegories the same thing? Um, so, uh, I would like to discuss those topics with you. Now, what is symbol, first of all? Well, the, the very first thing that I would like to mention is the usual combination and opposition between symbol and diabol. Okay? So, the symbolic and the diabolic representation. So, etymologically speaking, so in the history of words, we going back to uh, ancient Greece, once again, is usually a Greek or Roman world that we discuss here. So, the symbolic representation is a representation that allows multiple things to be brought together, okay? The term sum, which has a Latin Roman equivalent with cum, C-U-M, okay, is this togetherness, right? So, for instance, think of term as uh, combination, okay? Um, compassion, okay, the, com. the symbolic representation is this multitude, this uh, wide spectrum of possibilities. The opposite of which, this split, differentiated, separate um, option is the diabolic. So you have symbol as opposed to diabol. Okay? Now, diabolic became a substitute for uh, demonic and satanic even. Although those are very, very different uh, concepts, okay? So, uh, Satan from the biblical and pre-biblical narrative as the, the, the great trickster, the shaitan. Um, and uh, demonic has to do with, uh, again, a different parts of the Greek pantheon and the Greek philosophy, uh, the daimon, this inner uh, force within human beings. Now, the, the, the devil component here, the evil component, uh, now this is definitely a uh, fake folk etymology. Evil and devil have nothing in common, okay? It's, it's, it's not, it's, it's a false etymology here. But anyway, the devil as a word, it's read for the diabol, is the trickster par excellence, is the, is the thing that allows us to be separated, dissociated, divided, disintegrated as human beings. So, in, in the biblical narrative, in the Genesis, and for me, this little excursus in, in, in sacred texts, um, the, the temptation comes from the snake that will force humanity to see the world as separate, black and white, good versus bad, or good versus evil, okay? So, the symbolic representation is the divine representation, the holistic representation, the undivided representation the um, combination of multiple things all at once, okay? So, symbols are things that allow us to have multiple layers of interpretation, okay? Not just one or the other, which would be the diabolic separated um, presentation of such uh, element, all right? Now, uh, in practice, something that I included in, in the slideshow uh, is that symbols can be anything, really can be a representation that uses a variety of things. It can be uh, any type of item, object, event, uh, 
shape structure, logo, uh, script signature, um, architectural element, anything. It can be a flag, can be um, the uh, anybody's signature, can be um, a um, metaphor, can be um, a, um, an, an, a physical object. Think about a ring, for instance, or a badge, or a family crest. Anything can be a symbol. The point is that it at, symbolic representation attaches a deeper meaning, a special meaning to these items. Okay, so we have sculptures, we have monuments, all of which are symbols, and there are multi-layer symbols because they represent in the mind of the artist, but especially in the mind of the viewer, a multitude of things. Think about the Statue of Liberty, for instance. Okay, how many symbols that has, uh, and the same thing is in uh, um, the symbolic representation within literature, what kind of themes, what kind of um, multiple representation we find in literature as well. So think, think of things such as um, what are symbols for love, for strength, for luck, for justice, and you immediately have some sense of how you could represent that. You think about love, you can think about a um, figurative, simplified uh, version of a human heart, for instance, the shape of the love heart, I love you, for instance. Think about emojis, think about all the, the shortcuts that in literature we can utilize uh, within text messages, for instance, or uh, social media shortcuts to express certain emotions, all right? Um, now, um, what are other forms of this metalinguistic representation of elements. Again, the term meta is it's it's really a Greek term metaphysics, metalinguistics, and so on. That really represents going beyond what uh, what the primary term is. So, for instance, in, in meta communication, in metalinguistic representation, we should include posture, facial expressions. Uh, body movements, um, uh, overall um, demeanor, etc., etc. All the things that are not linguistically based, but that very often represent the majority of communication occurring at that time. This is very, very important in the context of public speaking, for instance. You need to be very wise in your choice of words, but also in the way you deliver your words, so your posture, your tone the overall emotional impact you will have on the viewer. And this is definitely important from the perspective of visual communication. So in other words, you can communicate the exact same thing with a variety of medium, some of which might involve visual arts, some of which could involve performing arts, and some of which only involve linguistic direct communication. Uh, but in all these media, you could give the same emphasis, emotionally speaking. Now, what is an allegory? If you don't mind going back to your uh, slideshow, an allegory is a story. Okay, it's a story in which all the characters, the settings, and actions stand for something beyond themselves. All right. Um, so there are elements that rely upon a universal, universalized cultural notion. So, for instance, we all agree upon the shape of a heart as a symbol for love, for instance. Now, this is a symbol that's almost universally valid at this point, um, and uh, it's expected to be immediately recognized as such everywhere in the world. Now, things are not necessarily the same when you uh, extrapolate colors and shades, for instance. Now, in the West, for instance, we tend to look at darker shades, black for instance, on a canvas, as symbolic of darkness, unknown, sometimes evil, think about a black heart for instance, and we tend to think of brighter things, so wider things, as good. Think of the Age of Enlightenment for instance, okay? Think of, etymologically speaking, all the terms that come from white, wise for instance, wisdom, all of those terms, okay? Now, this is a why that comes from a divine light. It has absolutely nothing to do with phenotypical manifestation, and that is a big mistake 
of certain pseudoscientific claims, you know, centuries ago, unfortunately too close to us, that would apply this difference in value between blackness and whiteness uh, toward anthropic element, toward uh, the human race, so to speak, complete nonsense in the area. Now, this representation, however, the darkness as mystery even, and this craving for something that's not fully told uh, in full yet, is relevant in, in a variety of examples in literature, for instance, or think about cinematic art, when you as the viewer sometimes have the ability to see something, because of the narrative, because of the plot of the movie, something that the main character is not allowed to see. So, for instance, you might be given the opportunity to see a certain figure, a certain shape, in a very dark room that it's, um, it's not uh, it's not shared from the perspective of view by the main character. So you have information that the main character does not have, and that creates suspense, creates tension, creates the what-if element of surprise in cinematic art. This darkness, this quite not fully expressed, untold element. Okay? So a story that goes beyond itself. Now, in English, we do have separate terms for history and story. This is not the case, of course, in, 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 in um, um, more original, archaic forms of languages. In Latin, for instance, or in Italian, okay, when we have um, storia as an equivalent. So the, the, the personal story becomes universally valid, and that's the point of allegory. Okay? Now, there are a few things um, that I would like to mention here uh, from the perspective of linguistics. Um, there are many, many uh, philosophers that I uh, should quote in this um, lecture. Um, we will talk about Walter Benjamin, okay, when we talk about the representation, you know, uh, the mechanical representation of, of arts. Um, in, in, let me use the term in modern times. Um, we'll talk about Jacques Derrida, the French philosopher. Um, we will talk about um, the psychological component of art. And, and what it means to find meaning in art, and what it means to communicate. Now, communication here is the shared wealth. Again, let me repeat this. Communication shared wealth from munus in Latin. Okay, so the, the coin, the monetary element, the, the wealth, the physical wealth, okay, the, the richness, okay. And again, we talk about the C U M cum munus, this share, the togetherness of wealth. Okay, so communication is this wealth we share. It's a web that is increased in size and strength by virtue of communicating. Okay? This is true also for many other disciplines, um, and that's why this philosophical understanding is so important. Think about the internet, think about computer science, thinking about uh, artificial intelligence, where our knowledge, by virtue of being shared immediately at the same time across the world through the uh, technological advancement, increases our ability to access information. So information is power. Information is wealth. Again, communication, okay? This shared element. Now, there are a few uh, things I would like a uh, student to remember by uh, um, David Berlow in 1960. And I will just read uh, through the slide for you here. So, communication does not consist of the transmission of meanings, but of the transmission of messages, okay? So, meanings are in people, you know, he famously stated. Meanings are not in the message, they are in the message users. Again, this is very, very important for the perspective of our class, but in general for art and communication. So, once a piece of art is produced, the piece of art does no longer belong to the artist only. It has its own life, a life that is recreated every time a person looks at it, all right? Um, so, for instance, I could create a new alphabet, for instance. The alphabet might look a certain way, uh, has a beautiful font, very uh, useful and immediately recognizable on the internet. But once it's created, what the viewer does with it becomes a new creation. Okay? Um, you could think of um, uh, video editing or, or uh, graphic design type of software. The software itself is a piece of art. And yet, it allows a new form of art to be created as a result of this shared usage. Okay, so, that is the important thing in communication. Uh, words do not mean at all, only people mean. 
Now, this is a somewhat extreme view within the Berlo. We might disagree with that from the uh, anthropological and historical perspective. Words were indeed created with an inner meaning. In fact, a lot of um, um, sacred texts and um, anthropologically uh, analyzed um, mythological um, sources claim that in many, many cases, words, communication, language was a God-given gift, or God's you know, multitude of divine beings given gifts. And this is true for the runes, for instance, in Germanic uh, mythology with Odin. Okay? It is true for the vast majority of um, uh, Semitic and pre-Semitic alphabet. It is true for the um, Egyptian hieroglyphs and so on. Um, and I will encourage students to take a look at the attached um, PowerPoint to find out more about it. So at a time where words, meaning, and shape were exactly the same thing. Now, there are more transparent languages than others, and by transparent we mean in, in the context of um, pronunciation. Okay, uh, English is not a really transparent language. In other words, um, just by knowing something in writing, you might not know how to pronounce it, and vice versa. There are languages such as um, the vast majority of Slavic languages, I would say uh, Serbo Croatian, Bulgarian, Russian, um, especially, um, the letter itself represents a phonetic sound, which is always the same regardless of how you combine, for the most part, that letter in the concept word. So having spelling bees outside of the United States, outside of the Anglo Saxon word, doesn't really mean much because if a person knows how to pronounce something, this person will know how to write it. Um, people can have similar meanings only to the extent that they have had or can anticipate having similar experiences. Again, meaning by definition is a narrative, is interpretation, and therefore is a psychological process. Meanings are never fixed. As experience changes, so meanings change. Again, what we said earlier about the cultural context, the historical context. Something that's not just you know, related to uh, contemporary philosophical speculation, you can think of uh, Hegel, for instance. Um, you can think of Heidegger, even, you know, you know um, um, sign and size, so time uh, and being. Finally, not two people can have exactly the same meaning for anything. And this is, again, the subjective experience. Again, experience and existence, if you remember what we talked about, existence over essence, right? Now, I have a few elements here. Um, uh, think about the sentence, um, I give you a gift, for instance, okay? Well, it's very clear that um, because of the structure of the sentence, I am the subject, you are the direct object, and a gift is, of course, what I, as subject, gives you as direct object. And yet, you, in this context, is really an indirect object because I give what? A gift to you, all right? So, to you is really the indirect object, okay? But because of the structure itself, this confusion is morphing to a clear statement because we rely on exactly what we just said, on the fact that we, are, have, we have a shared interpretation and then a singular individual translation of that interpretation, okay? Add a few elements here um, that um, serve that point. Now, of course, there are some uh, historical facts connected to this. Um, languages are <laughs> uh, living entities, so they change by virtue of being used. And this, again, this has to do with this shared element. Okay? Um, and so I encourage you to take a look at that. Now, there is... Um, a way to understand symbols, um, and you can think of symbols in the context of human behavior. Um, some of the uh, fears that I like students to remember um, are, for instance, Albert Bandura within psychology, and so the, the, the notion that behavior is its own self-representation to some extent, it's its, its own thing, so uh, this um, mimicking, observing uh, contemplating, you could say, 
uh, and following someone else's behavior becomes an intrinsic part of the psychological process. It's central to self-efficacy afterwards. Um, another um, study that I would like to quote here is a study by Ogden and Richards, 1923, symbols and semantic triangle. There is a representation here in your PowerPoint, okay? So you have a concept, this kind of gray cloud, okay? And then the symbol evokes a concept, and the concept itself refers to the things. Now, the symbol in this context stands for the thing, right? Now, concept, again, think about the etymology we already discussed, this um, combination is togetherness, this C-U-M, okay? Cum, C-P-O in Latin, concept, is the ability to grasp together, to grasp within even, okay? In German, uh, you know, if you, if you think about the word, again, by Heidegger, um, you will think about the Begriff, okay, so from greifen, from, from grabbing even, from capturing this object, okay? Now, once a concept is captured, it becomes yours, and that's the transcendental meaning of naming things, of labeling things. Once you name something, it becomes your own. This is nothing new in the context of uh, mythological, spiritual, and religious literature. Uh, so this evoking component is giving voice to something that exists. Okay? Now, does this thing exist on its own? Well, in the example here, we're talking about a jaguar. A jaguar is an animal. It's a very specific thing that can invoke many, many other things. Think about the car, for instance. Okay? And, there, and there's a chain of meaning in this context. Okay? Now, can we differentiate between meaning, symbol, and sign? Well, we can certainly do that. Now, meaning itself is a Germanic word. You have the, the German equivalent, meinen, which really means to signify. Okay? Um, and the sign itself, from the Roman Latin counterpart, is, again, to create something that is the appropriate conceptual representation of something else, okay? So the symbol is this reference, okay? This multitude of meanings combined together, okay? So you have uh, a symbol that uh, has an emotional meaning, a, a referential meaning, okay? Now, how can we interpret meaning? Well, we can interpret meaning based on the context, historical context, cultural context, and there is something that I like students to remember if you create a piece of art. Now, you can certainly um, claim that you're doing art for art's sake, okay? Um, think about Edgar Allan Poe in, in this context. You can think of doing art because it's uh, a cathartic element, it's a therapeutic element, and we will talk certainly about that when we will talk about art therapy and dance movement therapy. Um, but ultimately, once art is produced, it's a form of communication. Musical communication, audio sensory communication, visual communication, okay? So context is the key to meaning because the meaning is translated, it's filtered through the historical and cultural context, okay? Now, um, there are a few things that I like to talk about. For instance, when we talk about meaning, um, we talk about descriptors, definitions, labels, and so uh, if you think about meaning associated to a person, uh, one of the examples that come to mind is uh, theories of personality. Now, um, if you are interested, I would really suggest you uh, research the Big Five um, personality test. I will not tell you more about that, but for now I just want to, to uh, mention to students that there are a multitude of ways to describe how a person is, but some of the labels, some of the adjectives utilized in uh, modern psychological uh, theory and research that defines personality are actually based upon a semantic, semiological work. So just detecting how many times the same word is utilized in a certain angle, uh, language, you know, complex in English, and whether we can combine multiple uh, synonyms, words that have a similar meaning, into a simplified, all comprehensive meaning. Think about uh, neuroticism, for instance, okay? Uh, think about agreeableness, okay? As an example. Now, <clears throat> uh, 
Um, the reason why in, in this uh, lecture I men mentioned um, organ enrichers because they uh, they create a simplified vocabulary uh, for basic English, 850 elementary English words. Now, any simplified version of language, of course, is both a um, meaning maker effort and a caricature. Now, English could also be considered a simple German. After all, um, English is a Germanic language, uh, albeit a hybrid one. English definitely has a much more of a Latin component. English has this dual um, um, heritage, the, the, the Latin Roman heritage from the Italic branch of the languages through French and then the Germanic language uh, coming from the Anglo-Saxon word, Northern Germanic word. And so it should be similar to a Germanic language, but it, it lost, you know, essentially a lot of the uh, syntax and grammar um, strength that modern German still contains. One of, of the, the classical examples are uh, the endings, for instance, okay, the declension of verbs and so on. So you could think of archaic English, a kind of Anglo-Saxon English, so to speak, as closer to the mother tongue. Okay, um, But you could also think of language, at, languages in general at, as kind of historically active pulmonary system. So languages start from very, very simple structure and they become more and more complex as breathing in and extending your chest and then just the opposite becomes simplified and increase and decrease their capacity. Okay, So you add more rules and then you remove rules. Think about the alphabet for instance. In, in, in many cases think about the Semitic alphabets, we're talking about abjad, so we don't really have a uh, fully well conceptualized uh, vocalic sounds, we have consonants and the rest is added by virtue of adding diacritic signs, you know, usually dots or, or, or um, curvy linear uh, morphological elements and so on. Okay? Um, now one of the things about you know, basic English is it was very easy, but it was also very limited and limiting, kind of kind of boring in, in, in the way it was utilized. Now this is also the strength of English as a lingua franca. English is probably, if not the most you know simple language in the world, definitely one of the simplest in, in terms of learning. It it's, it's really has a very basic grammar, uh, a very basic vocabulary, um, definitely in comparison to any other European language. Um, within the Indo-European counterpart. Now, there are languages that have less uh, words, for instance, and, and, and a simplified grammar, but within the Indo-European world is definitely uh, the easiest to learn and the easiest to, uh, to utilize, and that's probably why it's so popular as well, uh, aside from political and, 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 and uh, military you know, consideration. This, you know, we are, it's pretty telling that we're you know, still utilizing the same alphabet that the Romans utilized in this context. So uh, English is a language and yet the vocabulary is based upon an alphabet that's still uh, a Roman one. Now, what else can we say about language analysis? Well, we can think about syntactics, pragmatics, we can talk about semantics. Um, and I just want to uh, restate what each of these words means. So uh, semantics, sema, think about the uh, term semaphore or traffic lights. So it's signs to things, semantics. Syntactics is signs to signs. Okay, so the sin component combination. And finally pragmat is signs to people. The utilization, how the how to the, 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 the ability to communicate. Now phonology of course refers to how something sounds. Okay, so the, to the phonemes, alright? So to you know, morphemes and, and how to combine the, the, the letter to its sound and the combination of letters to the more complex sound, something that is more complex in uh, languages that are not transparent, such as English. Okay? Now, languages are also based on rules, and from the perspective of this class, I would like to simplify our conversation. Um, uh, I have added some bibliographical references. Uh, I really encourage students to uh, review the work by uh, Noam Chomsky uh, in this context and even by uh, Steven Pinker. 
uh, by um, Umberto Eco, for instance. There are there are many uh, many others um, that I would like to suggest. Um, so familiarize with you know phonological rules, pragmatic rules, semantic rules, and syntactic rules as well. Now, to conclude uh, this uh, lecture for class number three, um, I, I mentioned some names. Um, for instance, um, uh, Umberto Eco, I mentioned um, um, Chomsky. Uh, I should also mention uh, Francisco Villar. I should mention Osgood. Um, there, there are many, many names that are relevant to this conversation. Perhaps it would be worth it to, to mention um, Osgood. Um, um, mediation hypothesis, and um, you should find a uh, description of that in your uh, in your slideshow. Um, and the, the core element here is response and stimulus. So th there is a uh, conditioning, psychologically uh, understood conditioning component in the mediation uh, hypothesis between you know. Uh, stimulus and response in the way meaning is created and shared. But for now, I would like to focus also on HAPS integration principles. So let's go to the PowerPoint. The greater the frequencies with which stimulus events or response events have been paired in input or output experience of the organism, the greater will be the tendency for their central correlate to activate one another. Okay? So I really want to focus on the frequency. Now, this is a class in visual communication. so. Uh, you can make the case that the more something is, for lack of a better term, repeated over time, the stronger the association between meaning and words, or meaning and symbol, meaning and figurative representation is going to be. Okay? Now, of course, there are evaluative factors, there are policy pattern activity factors um, in, in the context of semantic space, but for now, I just want to, uh, to uh, focus on this very complex analysis of languages. Um, so, uh, just to summarize, visual communication is, is the, the main focus of this class. We will talk about the visual component within art history and art criticism, and to some other extent to cinematic art and music history as well. But the other component, of course, is language. Language is all representation from a philosophical component, a psychological component, which is also a neurological component. We will talk about the neural underpinning of behavior in this sense but also the way language is constructed from the perspective of history, anthropology, uh, and semiotics. So thank you very much, and I will see you next week.